Good morning, Test. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our final installment of our New College of Florida presidential search. Uh, this is an opportunity for our faculty and our staff to uh, pose questions to our candidates for president. Uh, we have today our interim president, Mr. Richard Corcoran, joining us. Uh, I want to welcome you. And uh, just a quick reminder, uh, all questions should be given uh, at the front desk. Uh, I'll hand it to me, I'll, and I'll read them, get through as many as I can. And I want to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy day to be here today. It means a lot. Uh, thank you. Mr. Corcoran, please introduce yourself and uh, let the faculty know your thoughts and ideas on your candidacy for president. Thanks. I'll probably bore you because you guys have heard it now for six months and written a lot of stuff. I'll just give a background for those who don't know it. Uh, I'm married to my wife, Anne. We're almost 30 years married. Uh, we met in law school together. She's also a practicing attorney. And then we have six children, three boys, three girls. Uh, three are in uh, university level. Uh, one's at University of Florida Law School. One's at Florida State undergrad. And then uh, one is here. And he gets mad every time I mention that I have a student here. Um, but And then I have three, one in high school, one in uh, middle school, and one in elementary school. So um, that's the basic family background. I graduated from undergrad and I got involved in politics. Part of the reason I got involved in politics is I remember thinking to myself is, you know, there's two ways that people in my mind at the time generally get jobs. It's who they know or because they have one heck of a resume. Um, when I graduated, I think I've told you guys this, I went to University of Florida and I was there for like five semesters. I got six credits, had a 0 046 GPA. Point four six GPA, got kicked out, deservedly so. Um, and so then I thought, okay, I'm never gonna wow them with my resume, so I, I uh, need to figure out the other route, which is people you know. So I got involved in politics, just volunteered, started doing, all, you know, walking door to door, all that kind of stuff. And that led to a job in Tallahassee, working for, at the time, the minority leader. And, uh, did that for a while and then decided I want to go back to law school after being in meeting after meeting with all these political people that were lawyers and they always had the you know this degree of reverence which I didn't always get and I certainly still now know it d wasn't deserved but um, so then I thought I'm gonna go to law school I went back to law school and then during that time in 96 uh, Republicans had taken over the legislature for the first time since Reconstruction and the, the very newly minted speaker asked me to be his senior advisor so then I did that. Um, then I opened up my own law practice. I did mostly consumer law for a, a good while. And then I became Marco Rubio, who was a House Speaker at the time, his chief of staff. And then I ran for office, became Speaker after, at the end of that eight years. Then I quasi ran for governor. It was me and Putnam and DeSantis. I never qualified in June. I got out of the race before qualifying. And uh, then uh, DeSantis won the primary and asked me to do his transition. So I did the transition work and that led to me being Secretary of Education. And then I left and went back to the practice. So I opened up a new law firm and two consulting firms and I did that until um, this past February. And then uh, as far as new college, I, I, I wanted to leave as much time for questions, um, but we've put a lot of those ideas, a lot of those conversations I've had with you guys. Um, but you know, the business plan or the strategic plan I think is, is um, largely, um, you know, the things that we can do moving forward that I think enable us to be the, the best liberal arts college in the country. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get questions, but we can talk about and dissect those specifics that are in that plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I am David Rancourt, your Dean of Students. So I failed to introduce myself earlier. So, uh, Mr. Corcoran, you have, uh, you were hired with a mandate to make changes. What aspect of New College of Florida do you want to preserve amid these changes? The, um, I think the mandate was to, and, and this is alumni, I remember meeting with alumni when I first came down in March, um, very um, huge supporter of New College. And I remember talking uh, to him and his, his phrase was that, you know, because it was very um, raucous and, and disruptive and probably, you know, all of us I think would say the transition wasn't a, gr a great transition by any stretch of the imagina imagination. We would all go, probably go back and make significant changes. But his point was that um, what people needed to realize was that, and his phrase was that New College was circling the drain. 
And that was absolutely true. People don't want to believe that. They don't want to have that discussion. Having been in the halls of Tallahassee, having watched session after session where the ex very existence of New College was in jeopardy, um, it was an absolute true statement. And I appreciated the fact that he got it. He wasn't a huge supporter of the transition, or, nor myself, but he got that concept. And that was an important concept to understand. And so the change, um, I think, wasn't as much about and and um, changing new college, and uh, and I think that's a significant thing. Um, it doesn't mean change changes didn't have to happen. This, these aren't 100% statements. I'm just saying it wasn't about changing what was uniquely new college. You know, this honors college that's that's you know historically has this great reputation and has done great things. It was make that school successful because if it was a private school, it would have closed a decade ago. Um, so if that's the case, just fix that component. And so when I came, I thought, okay, and that, that significant change was just trying to bring about greater diversity, and that would be easy. Um, I always joke since with the governor and, and that I should have probably come down with my wife and done a tour because what I didn't understand or didn't know was how run down the campus was. I remember turning left the first time to come in and the, you know where you see the two new college, it's lit up at night, and there were weeds growing all over the sign. It literally, it was apocalyptic in my mind. It's like, this looks like it's, you know, how can a, a one of the 12 university systems of Florida and it has weeds growing all over the sign as you're turning in to welcome people. Um, but you know that that component I did not understand was how run down the campus was physically the physical plant. <clears throat> the other part is as I dug in more and more and more, and we can talk about example after example. And I will tell you, I could probably sit here for the entire 45 minutes and give you example after example that would shock you about how poorly New College was run. And when I say that. Um, I, I literally was naive in the concept of coming down, is it because with these you know, radical students? Is it because there's this radical faculty? The, the absolute stark thing that slaps you in the face when you come here is how poorly this university was run um, on all levels. Um, and I, I, you know, the first and foremost was, I remember talking to one of the senior faculty members, um, somebody who respected the previous leadership and and, and was friends, I should say more friends than respect, not the right word, but I remember that person telling me that never in my life, uh, this is one of the, the faculty members, never in my life have I met someone with no ideas, referring to one of your former presidents. Never in my life have I met someone, had just simply you could sit with them and they had no ideas. Um, and it bore itself out. Um, and I don't care if it, it, I could walk through every aspect of leadership at this campus um, uh, and all of that, that's much easier to change. Um, but, but you can't, I was saying to the students, you can't go anywhere uh, and sell somebody. If I wanted, to, I was saying to the kids, if I wanted to get $10 out of your pocket, if I took you to lunch today, I wanted to get $10 out of your pocket, the easiest way to do that is to say to you, here's this wonderful, big, amazing idea that's bigger than you and bigger than me. And if you give me $10, we can accomplish that. I'll get $10 out of your pocket every single time. And that's never happened at New College, certainly not in Tallahassee in the last 20 years, maybe it did in the, in the decade before that. Um, and it certainly hasn't happened at the foundation. Um, the foundation has successfully, over the last decade, lost money every single cycle, um, which is an amazing feat, an amazing feat given what New College is. So really, I think, to your question, David, what, what needed to happen wasn't go and change the fabric or the, or the core of New College. It was really, um, in the six months I've been here, just institute real leadership. You know, I remember we had, you know, some, I, again, I, I don't want to bore you because you guys probably have a lot of questions, but I, I could just go any aspect of the school. You know, you know, we had an incident with a, a student and, and criminal charges are filed. And I say, okay, what's the process? You can't have you know, somebody out there with criminal charges and we're not doing anything internally. What are we doing internally? And it's like, oh, you know, we have to do something. But nobody knew. 
And then they're saying, okay, well, the, the, well, the students afforded due process. There has to be due process. <laughs> We're America. And what's the due process? Oh, well, first step would be they go to this board. Okay, well, convene the board. Well, the board doesn't exist. I go, what do you mean the board doesn't exist? There's, well, what, what's the board? Well, there's a certain number of faculty, certain number of students. Well, okay, we'll just convene them. Well, we don't have the certain number of faculty, certain number of students. Why don't you have them? Because it's never been, in, we've never done it. How do you do that? How do you have a structure that's, that creates a culture of vibrancy, and that's the case? But I can, I could, you know, and I, you've heard me talk about the foundation. I mean, how do you not raise money, and then you not only not raise money, you lose six million dollars of your corpus. How is that possible? It, it, it's astounding, and I think that's what we're just trying to get there. And and when and and when you do that, the and you cast that vision, you cast that concept, you're going to raise money in Tallahassee and you're going to raise money from private donors. Thank you. Um, you have a lot of experience both as a legislator but also as in executive management, having served as a speaker but also commissioner of education. Uh, with regard to your role as president, what do you see your role in a shared governance in shared governance cases where the board of trustees, faculty, and administration may be at odds? I don't. I don't think that should be the case ever. You know, I think what what in all our conversations to date, uh, going back to I think you know remember if you remember, I, and I told you I should have gotten with you guys sooner, but the problem was March and April were the legislative session, and if there's one thing I recognized being on this campus for 24 hours is it needed tens of millions of dollars. And the only pot that I could go get that from at that point in time was the legislative session. So I spent a ton of time in Tallahassee. But when we did get together, um, I, I, what I was saying to you guys is that I'll follow all of the procedure. I'm a lawyer. I mean, you get thrown out of a courtroom if you don't follow procedure, um, let alone sanctioned and disbarred and all those other things. So I'll follow all the procedure. My only request of you guys at that point in time was if something was 30 days, I might ask you to do it in three. If something is 15 days, I might ask you to do it in one. We have to expedite that process. And we have to ex expedite that process because even with the success we had coming out of that first legislative session, it is not enough at all. It's not enough. A t we need another great session. And so, and then having that great session is you can't go up there and spend 60 days and say, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna reinstitute it, we're gonna be the best liberal arts college, and then it do nothing happens, and then we go back up there, like you said, you're gonna do this, that, and you're gonna increase enrollment, you're gonna do this, you're down in enrollment, you're this, you're that, no, we're not doing it. It's the same old story we've heard from New College for two decades, we're done. Um, and so, you know, I think, and, and to the credit, I see at least one of the division chairs. Um, you guys have been fantastic. I mean, we went through a ton, you know, and we would get applications, we'd send them, and, and I think it was just a, a Herculean effort on, on y'all's behalf on who we, you know, when we went to the opening faculty reception. It's just a great group of people, and it's a great group of our returning faculty that have stayed. Um, but that process should work. You should work together. If the, if the goal for New College isn't this wonderful, great thing that's bigger than all of us, that we can get past the, 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 what should be the simplistic, complicated dialogue between administration and, and faculty, then, then it's because we're not seeing the big picture. And I think what we have now is, is this beautiful pathway to people seeing the big picture of what we can and will be. We do have an amazing faculty and staff. Many are present today. Uh, what plans specifically might you have to enhance, increase staff and faculty salaries, especially in the face of higher costs and ongoing inflation? It's, um, it's simple. I think at a liberal arts school, you know, let's say we were just on, on cruise control. And let's say we, we worked through all these, these dynamics and now we're on cruise control. I think in a liberal arts school, I've seen the students, if you're at a research one university, maybe it's 50% or 60%, but at, at a liberal arts school, I think 90%. Yesterday was probably, I, I see Sydney Gruder, so I'm thinking it now. Yesterday, I was probably close to 90% of my day was fundraising. Um, and I think that should be really, once we get into a good place, that's, that's where it should be. And there's really two big pots at a liberal arts school. One is obviously the state, and we have that, we're afforded that, unlike most liberal arts schools. 
99% uh, of liberal arts schools are not afforded that. We're, we're a state liberal arts school, so we have that pot of money, and it's the easiest pot of money, easier, nothing's easy. It's an easier pot of money to go grab. The private donations, which is what all other liberal arts schools live off, which is why hundreds have closed in the last decade. Um, it's why we would have closed had we been private a decade ago. Um, that pot of money is harder. Is, is, is harder. But both pots, again, I'll tell you, it's easy to get $10 out of someone's pocket if you can say, this is what we will be. This is what we were. This is what we will be. People don't even know our grading system. They don't even know our, our Fulbright data. They don't know anything. How, for, how could we exist for 63 years and, and in Tallahassee, until this controversy hit, they didn't even know that New College was part one, one of the 12 universities, for the most part. Unless you were in appropriations or in leadership, and there was a movement to move this school called New College that you had never been on to either FSU or, or UF or close. That's the only concept you knew. Um, that's just not, that doesn't work. But, but technically, um, if, you, if you spend that time and you have those resources, um, great things happen. So what did happen? We raised $50 million out of the legislature. What did that mean? The largest pay raise in the history of New College. Is it enough? Did it get us to where we were with the rising inflation? No, but it's the largest. Did we have rising inflation in the previous 63 years? Yes, in the previous 63 years with rising inflation, did we have the pay increase we had this last year? No, not even close. So what we've done already in six months, and that, that, that was less than six months, is have the largest pay increase in the history of New College for faculty, staff, and administration. I think that continues. If we continue to have and continue to block and tackle on getting the word out of who we are, what we're doing, what makes us special, casting vision after vision after vision of different things that we could do that grow students and grow revenues. That's if we grow students and grow revenues. You know, I look at you, are you guys, if I asked you, what's your job? You know, I'm, a, I'm the, you know, a professor of history. I'm a professor of, you know, Spanish, whatever it might be. No, you're not. You really aren't. Am I the interim president? No, I've said it over and over and over. Every single one of us are an enrollment recruiter. And if, if I, and, and I would say it in the first 30 days, the only thing I worried about was enrollment. I would go into meeting after meeting. I go, how many people can you name that you have coming in the fall of 23? Name me the students. I could. I could name five. Everywhere I went, I said, you got to come to New College. You got to come to New College. Every parent I talked to, you got to send your kid to New College. You got to send to New College. I could name you five students who are on this campus because of me. But, that, but, but if everyone on this campus recruited three students, that's almost 1,000 kids that would be new students in an enrollment class. And when we do that, had you guys done that in the past, guess what? I'm not here. Guess what? The legislature is not breathing down your neck for prove your case or we're moving on, you know? And when, the, and when New College did come with a pitch, when they did go up there and they said, you know what? You give us $6 million. I was a pro chair at the time and approved it and pushed it because I love New College. I said, let's do it. It's a great liberal arts school. It's the best education you should get. Let's give them the money. And if you do that, we're going to hire these faculty members and we're going to throw enrollment up to 1,200 people. We gave it to you. I think you were at 850. And when I arrived at the end of the semester, you were somewhere around 600 with $6 million more dollars. Well, I can tell you what that means in Tallahassee. You're done. Your credibility's shot. They're done. But that's, that's just not what, what we're doing. So you, know, you sit there and you say, OK, if everyone can think of three people, if we can drive enrollment, if we can drive those things, which we have shown, then we can go back up there in January and February and have another great session. And I think that we have never been poised for a better time. But, there, but, but again, when I say it's easier, politics is just riddled with complications. So yeah, if, if, if last year was like this year, um, I feel 100% confident. But this year is complicated. We have presidential races. The session's been moved up to January and February. You know, the governor's going to be doing a lot of, you know, political stuff. You know, the, the legislature, there's always that natural separation of power tension between the legislature and, and the executive. Like, what authority do you have? What authority do we have? It's, it's just riddled with complications. But, but the best part is this session, as opposed to last session, we can say, here's all the things that we have done that have never happened in 63 years. And that helps. But we have to keep going and blocking and tackling. Otherwise, because I cannot stress enough, um, the list of things that we still have 
that need to be moved forward. And if we want to expand everybody to the west side of the campus, if we want to build another thousand beds, which is what we would need in the next five years at this current growth rate, um, we need a tremendous amount of resources. And so hopefully we'll, we'll continue. But it's easy, again, I'll always go back, it's easy if you have a vision that's bigger than anybody in the room. Thank you very much. Uh, the physical manifestations of improvements are obvious on campus. We have many new and returning faculty and staff. We have many new and returning students. How do you plan to bring our community together and build consensus and unity at New College? I think the, the, the best answer to that is what I just said. If, if everyone says, okay, this is what we can be, the, the, littler, the, the little things, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's too strong of a word probably, but the petty things can be overlooked. And I think when I talk to faculty, when I talk to the students, when I talk to student leadership, I talk to faculty leadership, there is a drive to create, everyone recognizes there is a new genre of people that have come to the school. Um, and everyone recognizes, a and there's a unique, special, wonderful desire for everybody to make that work. And, and again, you know, despite the rhetoric, you know, the facts matter. Name a liberal arts college that you think is wonderful and great, or is a top 100, or is whatever, and I will tell you, 95, 97% of whatever schools you have in your, in your mind have sports, and 30% of the students at that campus are student athletes. So it's, this isn't, and by the way, that concept of sports at New College, again, this is vintage New College where the leadership, the, all you'll ever hear me say is the leadership is, is crazy. So I was talking to one of our faculty members and he said to me, he goes, you do know that there's a whole strategy plan from 2016 where we added sports. I go, what, why is everyone so upset with me then? No, no, it's a, it, show it to me. Sure enough, it exists. Guess what was done with it? Nothing. And I will tell you, that's the new college leadership experience. Great idea, great concept, great something, great this, great that. Nothing ever happens at the leadership level. The leadership here has been, for decades, as wonderful as both are, and I worked with both of them, at least the last two, was a Board of Governors member, as a member of the legislature, wonderful people. I would not have them in charge of anything, again. Um, and, and it's not me being pernicious, it's just a fact. Because every single time, bring up anything on campus, I don't care if it's the foundation, discipline, any item like that, uh, sports, it existed and nothing was done. Nothing was done at the leadership level. They didn't even ask for money in different spots with the legislature. They didn't even go up there with pitches. And yet they were paying lobbyists. I mean, their lobbyists couldn't help them cultivate some sort of concept or, or vision. Um, but I think that, you know, that's, I, I'll, I'll belabor it, but that's the thing that needs to get fixed. Thank you. We have a, an amazingly beautiful physical property here, a waterfront. We have great rec sports and intramural sports. Uh, now we have intercollegiate sports. Uh, what plans do you have to maintain or expand both uh, the rec sport programs and the intercollegiate sports? I, I say it. Uh, all of the staff, all of the time. I say it to all the faculty, all the time. I would say it to everybody, every chance I get. Well, you know what the standard is? The standard here on anything is we're the best. We're the best. And I've said it at one of the first faculty meetings, I remember you know, um, saying that, in talking about the physical plan, is that, and in, in having you guys come talk to me, about things that you would want or do or, or something that you submitted five years ago, seven years ago that never happened, is the expectation became mediocrity. Like that was like, that was the, the, the great thing was when you got mediocrity. So you'd go and you'd say I'd like $10,000 and they would, and you would thought to yourself, if I get five, mediocrity, if I get five, I'll be super happy. And they gave you $400 and you still took it and did the best you possibly could with it. But you just knew that the, you know, you're not gonna even hit mediocrity. And if you did hit mediocrity, and I'm talking about m money for whatever it is that you wanted, um, that, would be the, that would be the goal. And it just, it's defeating. It's, it's demoralizing. It breaks a culture when you can't even get anything that you know, that what, what I was saying to the students, here's the top three priorities. Student enrollment, growing, growing the campus, and growing the campus with the right students. You know, we, you know New College has been 
um, historically and wonderfully known for having high intellect students. We must get those first and foremost, you know, and we must grow first and foremost. Second is we need to make their student life wonderful because if we get them, they're more easy to come when the student life is fantastic. And they're certainly more easy to keep if student life is fantastic. Those are the top two priorities. And, and so everything should be, and then the third one is growing revenues. You know, we ought to be able to show that if we were a private school, we could survive. Right now, we can't. Our discount rate is zero. That means we would close. Um, most private schools that I talked to, president of Ringling College, what do you think his discount rate is? 20, I think he said 27% and he hates it. It's way too high, he told me. He, uh, you know, we used to be at about 15, 16%. Need to get back down to 15, 16%. What's ours? 100%. That's how far off we are from being a successful liberal arts school, standalone, without state support. Most liberal arts colleges will tell you they try to hover at 50 or below. Again, we're 50, 100% off of being successful. Um, that's the dynamic of the math of this liberal arts school. But I always forget where I get. I get off on tangents. What was the question, David? Sorry. I think, I think you covered it. Uh, NCA sports expansion, rec sports oh, expansion. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that, I, now I remember. So, so I always say that you know, we want to be the best. You know, so whatever that is. So I say to Tyler, I go, Tyler, what were the hours in 22 for Caples? Oh, we only could open here and here. What were the hours for the, for the, the gymnasium? I mean, the, the workout facility in the pool. Well, I had it because of people I had to close from like two to five and then we'd reopen or whatever. And, and I said, fix it all, library, whatever. Every single thing I said, I, I do not want to hear from one person. I, I nag the provost all the time. Are we, up in student, are we up in faculty? Are we up in course offerings? Are we up in everything? I want to be better every single chance we get than ever before. So if there's something on this campus and you say to me, you want to get, get me fired up and get me calling somebody and saying this is not acceptable, is come to me and say, last year at this you know, forum, we had set up 100 chairs. This year, you only had 50 set up. And I'll get in my car and I'll say, why were there only 50 chairs set up? There needs to be 125. Uh, everything is going to be better. Clubs, offerings, gymnasiums, cables, what food, housing, everything will be better until we are the best. Thank you. Uh, as a point of personal privilege, I'll give you a heads up that Tyler has a business plan coming your way, so thank you. I did. I went, I went around. I gave Tyler a shout out. <laughs> you know, I went around and I said, okay, you know, I would just say to people, hey, tell me what it is. What, what, what is it that you would want to make X, whatever you're doing, successful? Anyone that would come up to me, I would say, tell me. What, 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 what haven't you had in five, ten years? And people would send me emails that they sent to leadership from ten years ago that were never even responded to, which were great, great recruiting ideas that I took a ten-year-old memo and sent it to enrollment and said, I want this happening ASAP. Make it happen. Make the trips, make the engagements, make it happen. Um, but I, so I would say that to everyone. I said to Tyler, I go, Tyler, I mean, how, tell me, how do, we, you know, how do we expand? How do we do this? How do we do that? And I would say that to everybody. And I got sheets of papers and visions from everybody, none compared to Tyler's. You know that meme that you see on reels when you're you know, bored and can't fall asleep and you watch reels and it's like, um, and it's some phrase that they say, he got the assignment, you know, because, you, know, you know, Tyler got the assignment. I think it was four pages, and it was, you know, I need four new sailboats, I need six motorboats, I need a pickup truck, I need, uh, you know, all these things for the students. I mean, it was just a list, you know, uh, paddle boards, uh, kayaks, uh, new everything. I mean, I always joke that Tyler got the assignment. He's like, hey, if I just heard there could be a Santa Claus moment, here's my list. Um, but Tyler's doing a great job. Thank you very much. Since we're talking about the ambitious pursuit of excellence, uh, let's talk about and please share your vision with us, both for staff development, professional staff development on the staff side, but also on the faculty side, support for research and grants and the pursuit of excellence uh, on a personal uh, as well as collegiate level. I'll, I'll break them into two. There's the staff side, and then I want to talk about uh, faculty um, recruitment and enhancement. Um, on the staff side, uh, what I was saying is, I think it, it just a, a leadership style, and I steal everything. I don't want you guys to think these are my ideas. I just, you know, from reading Good to Great, Built to Last, all these great business books, you know, what's a, you know, what's a level five leader? How do you lead well? You know, so all these are borrowed from books. But um, I think you, as 
on a staff side, it's my job as a good leader to go out there and say, um, and hire, you know, Bill or Sally. And I hire Bill and Sally. And then, so I've now, as Collins would say, you, you know, I've got them on the bus. I've got Bill and Sally. And that's only half the battle. The other half of the battle is you can, you can hire talented people, but they're in the wrong seats in the bus and you just still have chaos. But you hire the right people, then you put them in the right seats in the bus, and then you engage with them. So we have like, you know, presidential council meetings weekly. And you engage in them, engage with them. And in that meeting, you know, it, it's, it, it should be raucous. People should say whatever they want. And your vote should be just one vote with everyone else in the room. Everyone else has the same power and clout in that room to make a decision that's in the best interest of New College. And, and then you get out of the way. Either I hired the right person and put them on the right seat. That's my burden. And if I did that, I, at that point in time, should just say, okay, where are we on X? Where are we on Y? Give me updates. What are you thinking about next year? What do you, whatever. And defer to them. Um, and if, if I can't do that, then I should cut my losses and make changes um, immediately. You know, I think what bad leaders do is they never make changes. They say, okay, it's not working out in HR, or it's not working out in, in you know, our, our recreation, or it's not working out in um, student services, or whatever it might be, and then they say, well, I'll give them another chance, or I'll wait another six months, or I don't know how to, you know, and, and, and that's how entities, businesses, schools collapse. So I, on the staff side, how I grow staff is I'm, you know, it's six months, we still have some other leadership positions, but generally speaking, I think we're probably 80% there of, of, that I'm happy with, of getting the right people in the right seats on the bus and now letting you guys um, do great work. On, on the faculty side and on the student enrollment side is, yes, there has been a very slow, um, measurable decline in student numbers um, over the last 10 years. Um, and this year, um, an, another uh, decline, um, and probably greater than the previous seven. And, but there was two dynamics, really three dynamics that were in play. You know, one is if you're a student and you're a 1400, 4.0, whatever, you've made your decision where you wanted to go. You have a list of 10, and you've said, okay, number one is Florida, number two is Florida State, whatever, number one is New College, and you've made your, you apply, and the only thing you're waiting for come February is for them to, uh, did you get in or did you not get in? And you get into your one school, you're going. You get into your not one, but two, you're going. It's that, you know, and so when we got here in March and April and May, we missed, you know, unless you had already applied. In fact, the first thing I did was take home 1,200 applications of students that had applied, because I thought the best pool of people to grow enrollment are the people that already applied long before this. And, but now we have, you know, the third thing that caused difficulty was this transition. You know, we're in the press, we're in the news, it's all negative. And so how do you recruit students when you have this negativity? I don't care from what, you know, whatever ideology they were from. Everyone was, you know, in theory, packing their bags. And so that was the third component. But we didn't have this for the students, and so, you know, again, that was the first easiest bucket. Let's go through these kids and see, you know, and, and we had money from the legislature, let's start offering them money. Um, and then we, the second bucket was, okay, now let's recruit athletes. Again, if you're an athlete, um, you've made your decision long before uh, March, April, and May, for the most part. And so we had to go out there and we looked at transfer portals, everything, you know, we chased every single hole. And, and the same was true of faculty. If you, I don't know how many times somebody would say, that they may have interest or, or were interested, but it was April. They signed their contract a long time ago. We had it with our existing faculty, some who wanted to stay, but already signed with a great liberal arts school somewhere else or were tenured at a great liberal arts school and having to try to get those folks to stay. Um, but now what we have moving forward um, is time. I think I said at the faculty meeting last time if you were there, is it's the first time where I, could, I literally can breathe. Um, and I, I say literally, that's the wrong word, but figuratively can breathe. It, it just feels like, you know, we had, we, we did three very, you know, we hired a bunch of faculty, and you guys were fantastic. That's on you guys. Um, we have the largest class in the history of the college by immeasurable amounts, and you guys are continuing to work through trying to get a, a more substantive core curriculum. All those things are wonderful. And so when I go to Tallahassee, those three things I talk about, and I also say this, is that now we have a whole year. 
So now we can open, you know, working in that shared governance, we can open up more lines, we can hire more faculty. And so if we do have a class of 500 or 400, and we do have the highest scores ever in the last decade, those are the two goals, four to 500, highest scores in the last decade, and we'll achieve both, make no mistake about it because we have this whole year of recruiting. And when, when that happens and we go to Tallahassee and we say, or we go to private donors and we say, hey, we'd like money, um, it makes it very, very easy. And so I think um, what's nice is, is what we didn't have in the last six months, we have double that now and that is time uh, to go out there and we will. We're gonna hire, because we're gonna have this other, another large class and we're gonna need more faculty and we're gonna hire those faculty. The only problem we have moving forward, which I spent most of my time in Tallahassee, I asked for $7 million immediately. I'm gonna ask for a ton more money during the legislative session is we have a housing crisis borne by two great things. You asked us to grow. Our housing crisis is born number one from growth and it's gonna be exponentially more difficult next year. And two, because we took kids, again, leadership stuff, I'll go, everything I complain about will be leadership. We took kids, 210 plus beds, out of dorms they should have never been in. They should have never been in. Um, those two things have us in hotels. Those two things should have never happened had you had good leadership over the last 20 years. Thank you. You uh, touched on this briefly in your last remarks. Uh, th this question is specifically about curriculum. What changes would you propose, propose or what changes do you think w you would recommend or are necessary with our curriculum? I think, you know, we've had those, you know, we, we've all, and I've talked to a lot of you guys ind individually, but I really do think it's a bigger concept. Is like, okay, let's just say we were a private school, new college in Florida. Uh, I, I don't even have to make it up. I'll, I'll make up a real school, my alma mater, is St. Leo College. Where is St. Leo right now? You know, how are they doing? They're on the verge of bankruptcy. If they haven't already done, declared bankruptcy. A, a preeminent, you know, almost 100 year school um, in the Sunshine Conference, thriving everything, um, but, but long before this point in time, in defense of New College, is of all liberal arts schools, they're dying. They literally are dying. And then COVID just put it on a, a bullet train, put a ton of those schools on a bullet train. Some of the faculty we hired this summer, tenured faculty from schools closing or merging or whatever it might be, or cutting back, immeasurable cutbacks, um, which is just you know a slow death. You're better off just closing. But the reality is, is those schools are dying. And, and so what schools chose, I think, generally, is they said, we're gonna be, it wasn't binary, but, but I'm gonna make it binary, is we're gonna be all things to all people. You know, if we can be all things to all people, which is really not a liberal arts goal, then we can survive. And so, you know, if we have to offer, you know, trades, you know, we'll have a trade component to our liberal arts goal. Um, if we have to go on and expand to military bases, go online, have satellite offices in 20 different places in America, we'll do that. St. Leo model. St. Leo said we're going to survive, we're going to expand, and now just, you know, their hegemony is now coming to roost. Um, or the other one is to say, I'm going to be the best liberal arts school in the country because there's always going to be a draw for it. There'll always be people in this room, Richard and Ann Corcoran, who want their kids to get a liberal arts degree because we believe and know historically it's the best education you can possibly get. And so you do that. How do you do that? But we have to come up with some solid liberal arts concept that doesn't exist that we can go and sell and say, this is why we're different from any of these other schools. And, and I'm the, working through this core curriculum with you guys where we're talking about you know, that, that Steve Jobs intersection of technology and the liberal arts, I think is game changer. And it's a core curriculum. It doesn't mean we don't have all these 50 plus AOCs, but we have this core curriculum that is second to none and has everybody leaving here well grounded in, in the great questions of life and in this, in this techne model. And, and I've met with numerous ones of you guys, numerous faculty about it, and, 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 um, and I always hate, hate to say this because it probably, A, it's not true, and B, it, it, it sends the wrong message, but it's an open checkbook. Make it happen. Make it happen. Make it so that when Richard Corcoran at 18 comes on this campus and he says, you know what, I just want to major in philosophy. The only thing I like is philosophy. 
and I have to take a techne course, and I'm like, holy crow, I didn't know that was that. I might take another one, and another one, and now I have my philosophy major, but I have these techne skills I never would have got anywhere else, um, and vice versa. Maybe they come on, they go, I just want to be a data scientist. I just want to be, you know, that's all I want to do, but they take a course, and they're exposed to, um, you know, Greek mythology, and it's applied to their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I, I, you guys have heard me tell the story about Icarus, you know, and, but it's a great story, but, it's, you know, it's this guy who, you know, you know, that I read about, and he was wrestling with thoughts of suicide, and he, and he was talking about NFL players. NFL player suicide rate is off the roof. Take any, met any metric, um, you know, uh, NFL football players in general, um, all sports, but in, in general have the, high, you know, a super high suicide rate. And it always occurs after their career. How do you grow up in elementary school and you're a superstar? And then you go to middle school and you're a superstar and you're playing before 500 people. And then you go to high school and you're playing before 5,000 people. And you've got people in the stands who are recruiting you to go to the best universities in the country that you've always heard about or watched on TV. And then you go to University of Alabama or University of Florida, wherever it might be, and you're a star football player. And now you're playing before 80,000 people and everyone's sticking a microphone in your face asking you what is it like to be the greatest. And you win national championships and people want your autograph when you're just 18 years old. And then you get drafted and you're drafted in the first round, you're on TV and you're in New York, you walk up to the stage and everyone's seeing you, and then you get on a football field and you play for 10 years if you're lucky, and you make millions of dollars, and in, in essence you have um, a, a limitless, you know, hopefully you're married and have children, but you have a limitless, you know, opportunity of cars, uh, houses, trips, planes, and, and women, and then all of a sudden you're out. And now you're in your backyard in your million dollar house on the water somewhere in the world and, and in, in America. And you're, you're doing something that's wonderful. You're tossing a football with your kids, and, and you're sitting there, and the whole time you're tossing the football, you're unhappy. You just, you just you can't deal with it. And, um, and the article was about this guy who was not a football player who was thinking about suicide. And he had a friend with a liberal arts degree. He was a, he was a, a Greek you know, professor or whatever. And the Greek professor told him a story about Icarus that he had no idea about. And he said, from that point forward, any time I was tossing the football, or I was on the boat with the kids, or I was doing this, I just remembered Icarus. You know, yeah, I flew too close to the sun, but that's okay, I'm not dead. And yeah, and sometimes it's hard when you fly too close to the sun to come back and, and fly at ground level and, and be happy. But, but I had that moment next to the sun. I got real close to the sun and I didn't die. And, and now I have all these great memories that I can build uh, from here to forward. I just think you can't beat um, the wonderfulness of a liberal arts degree and the way it allows people to think. Um, and that's why, take any metric, I say it all the time, but Fortune 500 companies, I, I, I sit there with the bog and they're like, you know, now we're up to 65% of the people we want to have STEM degrees. I just saw a new university president was chosen and he said, talked about, and you've, you've read other articles about wanting to eliminate the humanities and do more, you know, STEM degrees at one of our 12 universities. Couldn't be more wrong. But that's the move. That's the move ideologically is a, an education gets you a job, nothing else. And if that's the case, we will not exist in 30 years. And education teaches you how to be a great human being and what it means to be a human being and what it means to be in a civil society. Um, and if you have that, um, it's game changer. And that's why when I talk to those guys, they're like, oh, we have this many engineers and this many, and you, you know, they all joke, you know, it's over wine and cigars. You're just, you know, liberal arts school. And I go, no, you know what we do? We fill C-suites. Number one degree, Fortune 500 companies in America, year after year after year, what percentage of degrees are liberal arts versus all others? We dominate C-suites. Why? Because we think right. We think outside the box. We wrestle with those great questions. We synthesize good information. We make good decisions. But, and that's what we have here. We have that opportunity and the curriculum and the faculty and, and student enrollment growth. And I think those three things, if we get them right, um, we'll be a model for the nation, and we'll be that. You know, I said to the students, you remember in 40s, 50s, everyone wanted to go to University of Chicago. But they didn't say; they just said we were going to Hyde Park. You know, you read books, and they're like, I remember going and spending six months in Hyde Park. But it was literally like a mecca of great thinking and thought. Nobel prizes. Um, you know, we'll be that place. We will be the next Hyde Park. 
people will come to Sarasota and talk about what we're doing at New College because it's where all the great minds will want to be. And it's where they're going to be allowed to flourish and think regardless of ideology. Thank you. Um, I'd love to get to, I have three remaining questions and they all touch academic freedom, student expression, and one in particular, uh, the regulation of teaching falsehoods, a comment that apparently you had made to the trustees at a trustees meeting. Uh, if you can hit all of that in a minute or two and then con uh, conclude with your closing remarks, uh, we'll be finished if you, if you can wrap those all together for me. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, I'll, be, I'll be real succinct and if you want to follow up with me, I'll be glad to answer it. But there's, you know, I, I was asked, I can't remember, it might have been during um, the interview with the trustees, but I was asked this concept of, you know, where is this interaction, you know, between, you know, freedom of thought, free speech, um, you know, what, where is it? You know, what is it? Is it, you know, it, it, and the, the reality is you can't have academic freedom without free speech. But by the same token, the point I was making was, um, and this is, we, we did this, in the Department of Education. The first thing I did when I got to the Department of Education is the governor gave me an executive order that said rewrite the entire education standards for the state of Florida. And the reason I wanted to do that was because, you know, you can't, you, you, the standards have to be, and by the way, it's 250 pages of standards. Um, you might read about a sentence here or there, but go read all 250 pages and tell me which ones you would change or delete. Yes, maybe you would take a sentence out here or there, but they, I, our standards are the envy of the country as a whole. And my point being is you have to have these guardrails, otherwise you're going to produce a generation of kids who are not literate, either partially 20%, 10%, or 100% <clears throat> not literate. And that's unacceptable. What, you know, what's the most dangerous person in a society? Someone without hope. You, you, you graduate an 18-year-old kid, you send them out in the world, and they're functionally illiterate, and you say, go thrive and be prosperous? No. They're going to go thrive and be dangerous because you have taken away the one thing that allows them to survive and thrive in a society, and that is a good education. Um, that's why, you know, Frederick Douglass says that the denial of somebody of an education, which he would say, you know, is, is the glorious light of truth, is the denial of that is a crime against humanity. People should be put in jail for denying that because it goes strictly to human dignity and who we are as, as a society. And so the point I was making was, no one's gonna argue with me for the most part, fire's hot, rocks are hard, water's wet. You know, generally speaking, those, you know, two plus two equals four. And when you start getting away from that, and that's called academic freedom, it is not. It is a great, as Frederick Douglass said, not me, that's a crime against humanity. People should be given that great education. And, and, and this entire room, if we sat down and said, let's just rewrite the standards for a, sp a specific course, data science, you know, American history, whatever, we could all come out of this room probably in one week with a, a set of standards that we said yes. Every student who sits in that chair should come out of this class knowing these 50 things. That's, that's, that is what should be there in every institution. Every, everyone should come out with that great core knowledge in any given course. And I think all of us can agree on that. It's not complex. Um, but the, I'll just close. I, you know, I've spent a lot of time with most of you guys that I see in the room. Um, but I'll just say, I think the vision that we have is good. Um, it's great. It's wonderful, um, and it's and it's a model for the nation. And you know, I just spent now. I was telling you, I spent about ninety percent of my time yesterday, close to it, not really um, fundraising. One of the meetings we had talking about this is a, a very successful guy. Again, a, a quick comparison in leadership is you know who's been very very helpful. But Ringling College raises fifteen to twenty million dollars a year. We're lucky if we raise you know two two and a half million dollars. Um, and I said to him, oh, are you doing it worldwide? You know, where are you getting all the money from, Larry? He's like, no, I never leave Sarasota County. How can he at Ringling, I think they have 12, you know, offerings, we have 50, they're not even truly a liberal arts school. Um, we're a great liberal arts school. How is that even possible? Um, but regardless, I was meeting with this donor yesterday, um, also a donor to Ringling, <clears throat> not a donor to us, and uh, just going through, here's, you know, things, here's like vision, here's what we're talking about. But basically just said, you know, you know, and he's a very successful businessman with a tremendous amount of experience in, in higher education, made hundreds of millions. 
And, but we went through the whole thing, but basically it was me and another staffer and we're saying, this is what, this is where we wanna go. This is where we wanna be. You know, and basically rip us apart. Tell us where we're wrong. And we would go through, we spent an hour, good hour of conversation with him. And he literally said, you know, a very nice thing. He goes, no, I'd hire both of you guys. This is, this is really, really good stuff. You know, he left. He was going on an uh, international trip. He said, you know, when you get back, we can follow up. Two and a half hours later, he sent both me and the other staff an email saying, I loved what you said about X. My wife and I have talked about it. We'll fund the whole thing. Um, let us know the amount. But that's... That's what new college should, any one of us should be able to have that conversation with anyone and say, this is that thing bigger than all of us, which changes higher education in society. If we don't get education right, we're not on a good track, but we can be the model of that good track. And if we do that, we'll be that Hyde Park. And it's something we should all aspire to. It's something we should all want and we should, you know, be bigger than anything beneath that. Doesn't mean those things don't matter. If you're, you know, you gotta be faithful in all those little things, but we should, but the, the thing that we should all strive for and, and recognize that this stuff is, is overcomable if, we, if this is where we're going is special. And that's, I can assure you, that's where I wanna go. Mr. Corcoran, thank you for your time today and for sharing your vision for New College with us. I want to also thank our faculty and staff, not only for their time, but for their shared commitment to excellence for New College. We look forward to the trustees meeting upcoming and their final decision, and thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful week.